Because of my involvement with the F-108, which was to be the newest air defense uh, weapons system, and when that program was canceled, I got involved in trying to help the, uh, the Air Force decide where we could test the advanced fire control and missile system. Well, we needed a test bed. We used the B-58, which could fly at Mach 2, but we really wanted to have the benefit of flying at Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, which the F-108 aircraft was, would have been designed to do. So I had the clearances to go into uh, Lockheed and the Skunk Works because they were in the throes then of a follow-on aircraft to the U-2 program, the SR-71, the Blackbird, and the sister airplane to the Blackbird was the YF-12. Well, interesting how these things do occur. The Air Force decided that they would like to be able to test the fire control and missile on uh, an aircraft such as the YF-12. My assignment at this point was to get $90 million to build three aircraft. And of course, this program at that point was all very top secret. The funding for it, of course, came from what we call the black source, not normal Air Force budgeting. So it was uh, an opportunity to, uh, for me to go out and, and work in the Skunk Works, I, which I did for two weeks. I put together a briefing that told the story of what the YF-12 uh, aircraft would be, what kind of an aircraft, the technology, and also why it was important for us to have this as a test bed for the ASG-18 Gar-9 missile system that would have gone in a long-range interceptor. So it was a, a good opportunity for me to, obviously, to uh, get this details from Kelly Johnson's people. Kelly Johnson was a benevolent dictator. He, he was known to have a small team, and that's what Skunk Works was all about. He selected what he thought were the best people in the field of aeronautics and manufacturing and whatever else involved to build an airplane. But he, Kelly Johnson was a man who was capable not only in designing an airplane, but in managing the manufacturing of it in new technology, where an airplane, they were using new materials, titanium, that had never been used before in the structure of an airplane. And Kelly, I, I walked behind Kelly Johnson for two weeks from the time he walked into his, the, the plant at 6.30 until he left at the end of the day. He let me do that even though he didn't really like me to be documenting his operation. The question was, well, gee, if Kelly Johnson and Lockheed can do this, why can't we do more of this with the Boeing Company uh, or uh, Republic, uh, whatever? And that's a, it's a good question. Uh, he found a way of, of, of forming a team of people, small group, and kept it small, but it was so much dependent upon his own personality because he knew every aspect of building an airplane, a new airplane. And when I left there, I had, was given the assignment to brief five people in the Pentagon. The interesting thing was if you were going to uh, get an approval for your, your, your story, your briefing, you got a thumbs up or you got a thumbs down. And this was a revelation to those of us that had to work in the normal system where we had to brief the Air Council, the Weapons Board, and a routine in order to go up and get a final decision made. And then you, you might brief this august group for uh, an hour. And when you left, you never knew whether or not you had a decision or not. The day came when I was to brief the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Thomas D. White. And I gave him this uh, briefing on, for 50 minutes, 
and in his office, and it was just one on one. There was nobody else in the room, and uh, so he gave me uh, after the briefing. Uh, he asked very few questions uh, at during the briefing, but he gave me a thumbs up. Well, uh, of course, I I was pleased to that. That was the second thumbs up that I had gotten. I needed three more to get the money, and. Um, that we were required for Kelly to go ahead and build these three airplanes. Well, the next day, I'm standing in the hallway of, in the corridor of the Pentagon, and General White was walking down with a group of uh, what I recognize as foreign officers. Apparently, they were going to lunch and somewhere down the way, and he saw me. And he excused himself from the group he was with. He came over and said, Colonel, he said, I'm sorry that I didn't tell you yesterday that that was an outstanding briefing. Well, I was obviously uh, terribly well pleased to get this from the chief of the Air Force. And uh, I, uh, it, was, it was something that I knew would make my day and a story that I would never forget. And that's what I'm telling now is the second time in my life that this gentleman had no reason to change what he was doing or where he was, but he chose to come over and make the point. And I thought, what a great individual, what a great officer that the Air Force has in somebody that would take the time and the, the pains of doing something that he didn't have to do. So it's a story in that regard. I had two events that General White proved to me the finest kind of a person that you could have as a chief of the Air Force. We got the $90 million, we built three airplanes, and in 64, the YF-12 flew and made the speed record of over 2,000 miles an hour. With some of the guys that I worked with on the program that had to do with air defense. And so it was uh, really uh, very heartwarming to, in my career to be able to have, we thought we had a setback when a program was canceled, of course, but then we were able to take the fire control and missile system and put it on board uh, another vehicle as a test bed and prove that it would have worked. And so uh, that is one of the things that most of us, of course, we get satisfaction out of knowing that we have a job that's been completed. And I feel that uh, the YF-12 program was well served. It's worth all the money and, and the, the, the time and effort that was put into being able to do it. When the SR-71 was uh, delivered to the Air Force Museum, Kelly Johnson, who's the developer and the designer of the, of the aircraft, etc., he came and gave a talk at the museum, and I was invited to be there along with others. And he, he mentioned, he said, that many of you that are here, because of the classification of the program at the time, one of you didn't know what the other one was doing and what his involvement might have been. But he said Ken Schulstrom was played an important role at, at that instant in getting uh, $90 million, which I, at myself, he said, I doubted that they were going to be able to do that. I was in the Pentagon, and in 1958, September, I was promoted uh, to full colonel. And at that time, I thought it would be a nice thing to invite my wife to come down and have lunch and to show her around uh, some, a few things in the Pentagon. So she did that. We, she came down and along with my boss at the time, General Hal Estes, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Air Defense Systems, 
he and my wife pinned on my eagles. Well, that was a big event, of course, in my life at that point. And after that event, I was going to take my wife to lunch at one of the cafeteria dining rooms. And then I wanted to show her the display case that in front of the chief of staff's office, there's a beautiful case of all the different models of aircraft that the Air Force has had since the Army Air Corps days, up through World War II. And for those of you that have been in the Pentagon and on the E-Ring at that location, you can turn and look and see the most beautiful painting. It's a huge painting in the stairway, uh, a B-17 raid probably over Europe uh, when this was uh, uh, World War II era. And um, it was uh, a, a painting that you would never would have seen any place else. And so it was very dramatic. And we were leaning over the edge of the, uh, from the, uh, the hallway there, looking at this painting, and we turned and looked and saw two people on the staircase. One of them I recognized is General Thomas White, who was the chief of the Air Force at the time, and he was talking to the Secretary of Defense, Neil McElroy. Of course, here they saw two people looking down at him, and we felt slightly embarrassed that we were intruding. When General White came up the stairway, he came over and a, a, much, a bit of a surprise to me to, to see him uh, obviously walk over to us. And he went up to my wife and he, and he introduced himself. He said, I'm General White. And, uh, and of course, I was so pleased that he would take the time to do this at that particular time and at that point in my life. I had just gotten promoted, and here I have the opportunity to get shake the hand of the Chief of the Air Force. Well, that's the first event that has to do. And then a more even significant event that has to do with the same individual. We continue with the design concepts of the Lockheed Company and Kelly Johnson. These designs set the company and the man so far apart from their contemporaries at that time that to this day, in one design alone, that gap has still not been breached. I think Kelly's uh, operation of the Skunk Works was probably unique in, uh, in aviation industry. To start with, he had a very, very small cadre of people. He handpicked everyone that worked for him. They were swore to ultimate secrecy. There was absolutely no leaks within the system. He was guaranteed of that. He also made it a point to co-locate his engineers and his producers, the people who were building the airplane, so the engineer could come up with a drawing and he would walk out on the hangar floor and talk to the man who's bending metal. These planes were so secret, it's only with the benefit of time that we can now look back in awe of their achievements. Even then, we'll probably never know all they were capable of. In the early 1950s, the expansion of the Russian nuclear arsenal and the increasing paranoia in the US was leading to the period we term the Cold War. President Eisenhower was promoting an open skies policy, virtually declaring his intentions to overfly Russian interests. In spite of the Russians declining the inquiry, the U.S. pushed ahead with the presidential policy and the world was pushed into nuclear hysteria. 
The fuel for the Western paranoia was the lack of verifiable information available to the US regarding the Russian long-range missile program. At the time, there was no aeroplane in the world that could safely overfly Russia and supply reconnaissance information. Kelly Johnson, who by this time had become chief engineer at Lockheed, forwarded an unsolicited approach to the government proposing to build and supply 20 of just such an aircraft in only eight months. Kelly had the previous track record in groundbreaking design with the twin-boomed P-38 Lightning, an outstanding success in the Pacific Theater during the end of the Second World War. and a record-shattering F-104A Starfighter that was just completing its production rollout. This plane was the world's first Mach 2 combat aircraft and in spite of its initial teething problems, its performance alone was so far in front of its contemporaries that it would continue its production for at least the next 30 years. The concept proposed by Lockheed was for an extremely high altitude reconnaissance and surveillance aircraft. The extreme altitude would keep the plane beyond the range of interception aircraft, anti-aircraft weapons and guided missiles. If the plane was out of range, then the need for high speeds would be diminished, and this allowed a huge increase in the unrefueled range of the aircraft. Kelly considered that some of the F-104A's concepts could be used in the production of this eye in the sky. The Starfighter was constructed for a specific purpose, with a very basic theme behind it. It would do without the things it did not absolutely need. Starfighter's new minimalistic airframe would be an ideal base to start on the special strategic reconnaissance mission after it was modified with huge glider light wings and lightened by deleting such weighty items as landing gear and the ejection seat. The aircraft that was unveiled at the Groom Lake test site in December 1955 bore all of these characteristics and the lineage from the F-104 couldn't be mistaken. Kelly Johnson made his incredible eight-month delivery deadline. It was christened the U-2 to maintain its secrecy, the U standing for utility in an attempt to divert awareness from its espionage roles. For the pilot, the U-2 was an extremely demanding craft to fly. At the extreme altitudes in which it would, the envelope between its stall speed and its entry to transonic flight was very narrow. In the U-2 at 70,000 feet, this difference was only about 12 knots. Below the 400 knot stall speed, the plane would fall back to denser air. Above 412 knots, because of its necessity of lightweight construction, the wings could shear off. Later improvements to the plane increased load and higher thrust engines saw this envelope decrease to less than 5 miles per hour. Its mission was to photograph ground-based Soviet military installations. Originally, it was hoped that the plane could fly so high that the Russians couldn't even detect it. As it turned out, although the Russians could see the U-2 on radar, it flew so high that it was out of range of their missiles and aircraft. There was nothing they could do about it. Because the Russians couldn't shoot it down, the U-2 flew freely over all of Russia for four years, taking pictures of all the Russians' high security military equipment. Finally, after four years of providing the US with the most valuable information during the entire Cold War, one was lost to Soviet action.
This caused an international crisis and the world held its collective breath. The loss also formally ended all U-2 missions over Russia. The U-2 evolved essentially as a powered glider, with a sailplane-like high aspect ratio wing and lightweight structure. A typical weight-saving device was the use of jettisonable wingtip wheels for takeoff stability. Landings were made on the main wheels and tail wheels, and the wingtips were turned down to serve as skids. In 1979, the U-2 was put back into production and rechristened the TR-1. Though TR-1 is somewhat larger, it's essentially the same aircraft as the original U-2. The once optical cameras have been replaced with newer thermal and electronic technologies and a number of engine upgrades have been made. The TR-1 is still in use today in its original role of covert reconnaissance but more specifically in areas of disaster relief and many other research areas, including with NASA for high altitude research. The designers at Lockheed foresaw the likelihood of the Soviets developing weapons to clear their skies of U-2s even before they were put into service. At the stage that the Russians could reach the U-2 ceilings with their weapons, the only choice left then was to outrun them. Even the most advanced fighters of the time were flat out at Mark II. Nothing came close to the requirements for these reconnaissance missions. To build a plane that would achieve a cruise speed beyond Mach 3, an altitude of 80,000 feet, totally new design concepts needed to be developed. It would also require totally new materials to be conceived. Along with this was the requirement of engineering new tools and machines to make the new aircraft parts. Everything about this concept would have to start from scratch. During 1957, the 12th proposal presented to the government met with approval, and so development began on Project Oxcart and the A-12. The planes of this series were later to be known as Blackburns. Lockheed had in the past used titanium in some of its developments, However, this venture would require 93% of the plane to be a new titanium alloy to achieve the integrity required. Even to this day, the landing gear is one of the largest titanium blocks ever forged. At Mach 3, the outside skin of the plane would be between 800 and 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, while the outside air temperature would be below minus 120. The stresses on the airframe would be more than anything ever attempted before. Every aspect of this plane's development was new or exhaustively adapted. Even the basic fact that standard construction tools would corrode the titanium alloy had to be overcome. Because of their cadmium coating which caused the corrosion, these tools had to be reforged to suit the production process. Totally new presses, mills and lades had to be developed for use with the new alloy. Presses would now have to function at over 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. New non-corrosive cutting fluids would have to be developed. The list was never ending. What is probably most amazing in today's world is that all of this was achieved without any computers. It was all done with slide rules, pencils and pieces of paper. After the initial constructions, the static testing commenced. Here you can see hydraulic testing on the airframes. 
force in the loading that would occur during Mach 3 flight. The corrugations in the skin were to make allowance for the expansion due to heat at beyond 2,000 miles an hour. And the biggest problem that he was going to face, and he knew this up front, was going to be temperature. The temperatures that the aircraft would encounter at those speeds, phenomenal. Every individual piece of the plane was tested, even the wheels, tires and brakes. What this plane was expected to experience, nothing could be left to chance. Safe evacuation in an emergency was simplified. As the crew's flight suits were closer to spacesuits, no special enclosures were required in an emergency. Specially constructed ejection seats and parachutes were used in getting the crew clear of the plane at over 2200 miles an hour. As the A-12 was in concept built as an interception fighter, the armament would have to be suitable for use at beyond Mark III. However, if the plane is traveling faster than a bullet, guns wouldn't have been of much use. The weapon design was the Hughes AIM-47 missile and the Phoenix missile system. This was later used very successfully in the Grumman F-14 Tomcats. However, because of political decisions of the time, the A-12 was never actually developed as an interceptor. It would only proceed in its surveillance form. This caused some consternation within the design team at the time, and perhaps widely so, as to this day, there's still no long-range interceptor that even comes close to the Blackbird's performance. Lockheed would have to live without the acclaim that the Blackbird so richly deserved and instead accept the mystique that has been associated with this aircraft ever since. The A-12 was first displayed to the public on September 30, 1964 as the YF-12A interceptor. The airframe was in its simplest form, a blended body and delta wing built around two of the largest engines ever constructed for an aircraft. Pratt & Whitney J58 engines produce 160,000 horsepower and the inlet temperatures can reach an incredible 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The long flattened fuselage, thin wings and specially designed paint achieved the first in genuine stealth technologies. In fact, the Blackbirds had less than 1% of the radar signature of a B-52. The engines placed midway out on the wings were continuous after burning turbojets left over 3,000 feet of turbulent air in their wake. These monster engines would consume in excess of 8,000 gallons an hour of their specially designed fuel. On Zymark missions, even with five onboard fuel tanks and special honeycomb storage inside the wings, the Blackbirds needed refueling every 45 minutes. On the ground, the Blackbirds actually seep fuel from their fuel cells, but once in flight, the expansion from high mark temperatures soon seal all of these small leaks. Kelly Johnson asserted that each flight above Mach 3 would in effect retemper the titanium alloy of the plane, in theory, prolonging the airframe's life indefinitely.
The main difference between the YF-12A and subsequent models was the shortening of the chines along the sides of the nose to allow for surveillance radar installations. To counter for the loss in stability, small ventral fins and a retractable central fin were added. The SR-71's existence, SR standing for Strategic Reconnaissance, was first announced by President Johnson on July 24, 1964, and the first flight of an SR-71 took place on December 22, 1964. Officially, only 32 Blackbirds were ever built. However, because of the secrecy surrounding the planes, it's safer to say at least 32 were built. These included the A-12, the YF-12 and the SR-71s and the training variant seen here during the intensive 12-month course. Interestingly, because of the additional drag of the trainer's cockpit above and behind the traditional cockpit, the trainer struggled to break Mark II in flight. One other variant was trialled, the D-21 unmanned drone. It would be used in a similar role to the SR-71 in strategic reconnaissance. The unmanned craft was originally designed to be launched from the back of an A-12 Blackbird, subsequently called an M-12. However, after a collision during testing caused the death of one of the test crew, it was modified to be launched from underwing pods on B-52 bombers. Several successful missions were flown during the late 60s, but the project was highly classified and details remained vague. The D-21s were withdrawn from service in 1971 and placed in storage. In 1968, a presidential order required that all molds and tools used to build the SR-71 be destroyed so that the plane could never be built by anyone again. This also meant that spare parts couldn't be made, so if there were any major problems, planes in storage would have to be cannibalized. On its way back to the US from the 1974 Farnborough Air Show, the SR-71 set another record. London to Los Angeles in 3 hours and 48 minutes, including time for in-flight refueling. In comparing local time, it arrived 4 hours before it took off. The acceleration when we made the first engine run and they had those afterburners going in there and that thing is straining against those cables and I just felt, boy, this is really going to be something. Though the Blackbirds have officially been withdrawn from service, their cruising speed of over Mach 3 and a service ceiling of over 15 miles has ensured that many of the records they established still stem today. In all the years of the Blackbird program, no SR-71 was ever shot down or hit by enemy fire, and they're known to have outrun over 4,000 missiles. However, they did suffer many losses. In fact, up to 20 were lost, mostly on the ground, during landings and takeoffs. In 1990, with a reputed price tag of over $30,000 per hour, the SR-71 program became too expensive to operate, and their last flight took place on March 6, a blistering California to Washington in 68 minutes, fittingly another record. For the record-breaking flight, uh, I was over at the FAA Control Center, and uh, 
the controller, uh, the huge screen, and he said, here's a 747 coming out of Phoenix. Go blip. Blip. It moved about half inch or a quarter inch. He said, okay, get ready. Here comes the SR-71 out of uh, Canada. And it goes, and there goes uh, my antenna, and there goes Idaho. <laughs> and, and get ready. And uh, it blew us out of way because he was right overhead. And uh, he, could, he was starting to desel, but he managed to blow the windows out of Zazak Gore's house in the Hollywood Hills. <laughs> In 1995, the SR-71's talents were needed once again and the program reactivated. Two Blackbirds were returned to active duty. Unfortunately, two years later, their budgets were again withdrawn and the aircraft were retired once more in 1997 in favour of satellite reconnaissance. Lockheed's next foray into the stealth technologies was more certainly in the interceptor and fighter bomber realm. Designated the F-117A Nighthawk, it was first conceived in 1978 and finally achieved operational capability in 1983. While this plane is a huge departure from the Blackbird, there's no denying the lineage in their appearance. Its design minimizes both radar and infrared signatures by using a combination of special materials and angles and shielding the jet intakes and outlets. The performance of the Nighthawk is heavily restricted by its stealth design. Its top speed is actually below Mach 1 and the strange shape of the aircraft makes it so aerodynamically unstable that it requires a computer to enable it to fly. There is no doubt these outstanding planes continue to expand the realm of aviation design, but there's still no comparison anywhere to Kelly Johnson's earth-shattering blackbirds. He decided he wanted to design aircraft when he was 12 years old, after reading Tom Swift and his airplane. He designed his first plane before he'd ever seen one in person. 
When he first applied for a job at Lockheed, the company turned him down flat. He got his master's degree in aeronautical engineering and returned, and was rewarded for his persistence with an $83 a month job as a tool designer. By the time his career at Lockheed ended 47 years later, he had built the most important aircraft research and design facility in the world. There, in Lockheed's legendary Skunk Works, he and the team he led revolutionized aviation. For 30 years, it was impossible to see a significant display of American aircraft without seeing something Kelly Johnson had designed. Whether it was a fighter, bomber, transport, passenger liner, or even a spy plane, the odds were that he had designed at least part of it. Without question, he is the greatest aircraft designer in history. He is Clarence Kelly Johnson. Clarence Kelly Johnson was born in the town of Ishpeming in Michigan's Upper Peninsula on February 27, 1910. The son of Swedish immigrants, he got his Irish nickname from schoolmates after he stood up to the school bully. He had been dealing with uh, some of the kids at the school calling him Clara since his first name was Clarence. And uh, he finally had his fill of it and uh, decided to uh, take reprisals on one of the bullies. And after he was finished, the kids in the schoolyard decided that he could no longer be a Clara. And uh, instead, they were going to find uh, some more appropriate name. And since uh, Irishmen were known at that time for their pugilistic skill, they decided to dub him Kelly. He designed his first airplane, which he called the Merlin Battle Plane, as a 12-year-old, and it won him a prize at school. He knew then that was what he wanted to do with his life. He paid $5 for his first flight, a three-minute trip in a biplane that ended badly when the plane's engine conked out at 700 feet. When he got older, he worked in construction and in the Buick factory and saved his money. He took his savings to a flight school and asked to be taught to fly. The flight instructor, a cash-strapped barnstormer, refused Johnson's money and told the young man to spend it on college. Johnson enrolled at the University of Michigan just before the stock market crash in 1929 and supported himself washing dishes in fraternity houses. As an assistant in the aeronautical engineering department, he worked with the school's wind tunnel the school allowed him to rent the tunnel out when it wasn't in use. Johnson charged $35 an hour and helped design a new streamlined Studebaker model. He graduated in 1932 and tried to enlist in the Army Air Corps but was refused. He returned to Michigan for his master's degree and, among other things, used the Michigan wind tunnel to help design aerodynamic racing cars for the Indianapolis 500. In 1933, he went to work for Lockheed in California as an $83 a month tool designer. Lockheed at the time was a deeply troubled company. It had just emerged from bankruptcy and had bet its future on the Electra, a two-engine transport. When Johnson arrived in Burbank, his boss asked him what he thought of the plane. Johnson looked and said it would be unstable and that he did not trust Lockheed's wind tunnel tests. Chief Engineer Hall Hibbard sent Johnson back to Michigan with a model of the Electra and a mandate to do his own study in his own wind tunnel. See if you can do better, Hibbard told him. He did. After 72 tunnel tests, Johnson came up with a newly designed flap system and traded the Electra's single stabilizer for a twin tail. Those changes stabilized the Electra and helped make it one of the most successful airplanes of its time. Johnson returned to Lockheed a full engineer. Assigned as the Model 10 Electra's flight test engineer, he at last started flying on a regular basis. He befriended Amelia Earhart and advised her on several of her missions. She flew an Electra, and Johnson advised her on techniques of fuel mixing to help her get the best performance out of her plane. He continued to work on updates to the Electra through Electra Model 14 and was soon attracting attention outside of Lockheed. In 1937, he won the Sperry Award for outstanding achievements in aeronautics by a young man. That same year, Congress passed the Neutrality Act. That law was designed to keep the United States out of World War II. At the same time, those in the military had become convinced that American involvement in the war was inevitable. 
They threw as many of their precious dollars as they could into the design of new equipment. Lockheed won the competition to build a new fighter with a plane designed by Johnson, the XP-38. With two engines and a double fuselage, it was an unconventional aircraft that had its share of problems. In particular, its high speed and tight maneuvering sometimes created forces so great that they shattered the plane in midair. Once again, Johnson went back to his wind tunnel, and after making a few changes to the plane's design, it passed Army Air Corps muster and was ordered into limited production. Johnson, the designer, was 27 years old. In the late 1930s, Lockheed came back from bankruptcy largely on the strength of its commercial aircraft. The Electra in particular had built a profitable customer base. But if Lockheed was going to grow, it was going to have to build a successful military aircraft business. The P-38 was a start, though when the Army Air Force first awarded the contract, no one knew how many thousands of planes would eventually be built. In 1938, with Europe on the brink of war, the British sent a purchasing commission to the United States in search of military aircraft, particularly a long-distance coastal patrol bomber that could be used to hunt submarines. The commission, scheduled to visit several aircraft manufacturers, did not originally intend to visit Lockheed. Their schedule changed at the last minute, and Lockheed was invited to make a presentation, with only five days to prepare. During the five days of preparation for the Brits, Johnson showed what he was destined to become famous for, the ability to make something entirely new out of existing components, and to manage a project to completion with a ruthless eye to the deadline. He himself lived by the credo, be quick, be quiet, be on time. Um, he was somebody who believed very much in getting good people and giving them the ability to do what they do best. He also believed uh, in minimizing the number of people working on any one project. In only five days, Johnson and his crew not only redesigned the Electra to fit the needs of the Royal Air Force, they also built from scratch a full-scale wooden model of the plane, a civilian transport converted into a medium bomber. The Brits were amazed. They were so impressed by Johnson and his crew, they invited Lockheed executives to England to confer with the Air Ministry. Johnson went along. At the meetings, the British changed the design specifications, necessitating a complete redesign of the aircraft. Johnson locked himself in a London hotel room and in only 72 hours completed the engineering drawings. The British were, once again, amazed, and Lockheed got the contract but not before the British expressed their hesitancy about working with an engineer as young and inexperienced as the 28-year-old Johnson. Lockheed reassured the air minister, who ordered 200 of what became known as the Hudson Bomber. It was the largest single order of aircraft ever received by an American manufacturer, and upon the party's return to the United States, Lockheed promoted Johnson to chief engineer. In 1939, the Congress significantly increased the defense budget, and P-38 started rolling off the line in record numbers. During this period, Johnson truly mastered the art of manufacturing, streamlining production processes, and developing an entirely new job, the program manager. Now a staple of manufacturing, the program manager is a person far down the chain of command who has working control of a project. If that all seems a bit heavy on the business administration in a discussion of aircraft, consider this. Johnson believed that outstanding aircraft designed and manufactured quickly were inevitably the product of a single visionary. That visionary was usually, of course, Johnson. He was not someone who believed in development via committee. Um, he was also somebody who hated lengthy reports and uh, normally limited any report that was sent to him to 20 pages. Um, he believed in brevity, he believed in clarity, and uh, he believed in get, giving people the tools necessary to get the job done. In 1943, Lockheed put Johnson in charge of advanced products research, setting him up on a plot of land on the outskirts of Burbank, California. 
Johnson called his new kingdom the Skunk Works. After the still in a cartoon strip, Little Abner, that was responsible for the making of a mysterious and powerful brew called Skunk Works. In the Little Abner cartoon, there was a potent uh, mystery elixir known as Kickapoo Joy Juice. And Kickapoo Joy Juice was made at the Skunk Works, or Skonk Works, as it was called in the comic strip, through a variety of things that were thrown into a giant mixture, among them skunks, old shoes, and things like that. And the nickname was applied to the Lockheed operation because, indeed, uh, it was a mystery elixir. Nobody was quite sure what was going on in there, but they knew that a lot of things were being thrown into it and that Kelly Johnson was pulling a lot of people from various locations in order to create something interesting. The job of the Skunk Works was to quickly, cheaply, and secretly develop advanced aircraft that could help win the war. Its first assignment was the P-80 Shooting Star, the first American jet. Intelligence had determined the Germans were far along in their development of jets, and the not-so-secret fear of the Army Air Force was that the Nazis would deploy their jets in large numbers before the war in Europe had ended. The effect on the Allied bombing campaign would have been horrendous. The Allies' propeller-driven fighters would have been almost useless against a jet-powered fighter. Kelly Johnson, uh, in his efforts to oversee those operations, would uh, pull people from other projects and would uh, go about trying to get a minimum number of the very best people and put them on the project, uh, give them minimal uh, supervision, but let them trust them to be able to do the jobs that they're chosen to do. After setting up the Skunk Works and recruiting his team, Johnson went to work on the P-80. Lockheed's contract with the Army Air Force gave him an incredibly short schedule, 180 days. Johnson went on a binge of designing and set his team to work on various critical paths and had the prototype ready for testing 37 days ahead of schedule. In five months, Lockheed had designed and built the first American jet. They hauled it from Burbank to Muroc Air Base in the California desert for testing. Fearful that there might be spies in the surrounding hills, they disguised the jet during transport with a plywood propeller. Johnson said years later that when he rolled out a new plane for testing, there was only one thing he thought about. What have I forgotten? In the case of the P-80, despite the short design and construction cycle, he hadn't forgotten much. It was a beautiful aircraft, faster and more agile than anything in the American arsenal. The war ended before it saw combat, but it evolved into the T-33, one of the best and longest-lived jet trainers in history. When the war ended, however, there were those who questioned whether the Skunk Works had a role to fill. After World War I, the business of aviation had shrunk almost to non-existent. After World War II, many people expected that it would again. But there were two basic differences between the ends of the wars. First, the United States was engaged in the world after World War II in a way it wasn't after World War I. No one could reasonably expect the world's only nuclear power to go back into hibernation. And second, before the war ended, it became clear that the post-war world would require a strong and ready military. Because on the day the Japanese surrendered, the world separated into two groups of allies. Those in the Communist East under the control of Joseph Stalin and those in the Democratic West. World War II was over, but the Cold War was just beginning. Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works were just about to become the most important aircraft developers in the world. Over the course of his career, Kelly Johnson designed more than 40 aircraft. His most prolific period by far was in the 1950s. That was a decade of tremendous technological advance, achieved in an atmosphere of never-ending crisis. And there was no better place for aeronautical engineers to work than the Skunk Works. Johnson designed and built the Constellation, the most elegant aircraft of its time and a plane that served effectively in both civilian and military roles. He experimented unsuccessfully with vertical takeoff and landing aircraft with the idea that they could operate from relatively small ships. 
He designed the F-104 Starfighter at 1,300 miles an hour, the fastest aircraft ever flown at the time. It was a sometimes fussy plane to fly, and at more than Mach 2, there wasn't a lot of room for error. It was adapted around the world to a number of difficult tasks, including carrying nuclear weapons. Johnson didn't approve of all the modifications others were making to his plane, but could do little about them. As the Cold War heated up, it became clear that the United States needed a way to peer deep into Russian territory. East of the Ural Mountains, where the Russians did their atomic research and where they developed their aircraft and missiles, the United States didn't even have an accurate topographical map, let alone a way of getting information on military capabilities. The Air Force put out a quiet request for a fast, high-altitude plane that could overfly Russia and bring back pictures of the communist secret bases. Johnson at first toyed with modifying the F-104, but it lacked the range and would be too difficult to fly on long missions. In 1954, he sent the Air Force a proposal to build a plane that could fly at a range of 4,000 miles above 70,000 feet. It would be slower than the Air Force had hoped, but at that altitude would be high above Russian air defenses. The Air Force didn't believe Johnson could do it. They doubted any jet engine would work at that altitude, and instead ordered a competition between manufacturers for the best spy plane design. President Eisenhower approved a $35 million contract with the competition winner. Johnson and his Skunk Works team went into overdrive. In mid-November 1954, he met with a government advisory board on what was then called the CL-282 project. Ten days later, he formed the team to design the craft. On December 2nd, the first 12 engineers went to work designing the aircraft systems, and the first design drawings were completed and released to the shop for manufacture the next day. A week later, the drawings were complete, and by the end of the year, he'd won the contract and frozen the design. Wind tunnel testing completed in March, the first plane finished in July, and the first flight took place on August 4th, 1955. In less than a year, from pipe dream to first flight, Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works had designed and built a completely new kind of airplane. The U-2 had something of a patched together quality to be sure. The first ones cut weight by leaving out the ejection seat and the balancing wheels on the wings dropped off at takeoff to lose a few more pounds. The engineers were still making modifications on the craft in the summer of 1956 when a young pilot named Francis Gary Powers saw his first U-2 parked on a taxiway at a secret base in Nevada. It had not been built to last, he said years later. Powers was among the pilots who flew spy missions over the Russian heartland in the U-2, and for years it was safely out of range of the Soviets. The planes routinely returned with photographs showing Russian fighters four miles below them, coming up for a fight but unable to fly high enough to get a shot off. Eventually, however, the Russians improved their air defenses, and by the time Powers was shot down in 1960, Johnson was already at work on his next generation spy plane. Johnson, with the U-2s flying with seeming impunity, had gone back to the government to propose a plane that could fly 10,000 feet higher and four times as fast as the subsonic U-2. Building a plane that would cruise at Mach 3.2, Johnson said years later, was the hardest thing the Skunk Works ever did. Everything about the plane, Johnson said, had to be invented. In 1960, the Air Force gave the go-ahead for Johnson to develop the A-12, a plane that didn't succeed as an interceptor, but paved the way for its slightly larger sister, the SR-71 Blackbird. Built out of titanium, which is light and could tolerate the 500-degree temperatures that built up, as the plane sliced through the atmosphere at more than three times the speed of sound, the Blackbirds were like something out of a science fiction movie. The rollout was Johnson's proudest day. It was, he said, the smoothest test flight he'd ever been through. Johnson, who had never been much of a talker, insisted that he was not bothered by the fact that he couldn't talk about his perfect airplane. 
If I can talk about it, he'd like to say, it's obsolete. But years later, when word of the SR-71 had leaked out and the Air Force had stopped denying its existence, he took joy in its racing from New York to London, a distance of almost 3,500 miles in less than two hours. And before the Blackbirds were retired in March 1990, an SR-71 flew across the United States coast to coast in 68 minutes. Kelly Johnson retired from Lockheed in 1975. Even then, he was a presence at the Skunk Works. His 14 rules of effective program management are gospel there and are taught in some of the leading business schools in the world. Johnson even consulted with Lockheed during the development of the F-117 stealth fighter. As an old man, he said that there would come a time when aircraft were no longer relevant. People wouldn't travel for business, he said, because they could sit at their desks and talk to people in Europe by video phone. And on the battlefield, manned aircraft were no longer cost-effective in an age of missiles. Though it hasn't happened yet, don't bet against it. I think his greatest contribution was in the vision that he had for the Skunk Works, for Lockheed, uh, for American aviation, and in his ability to translate that vision into something that other people embraced and believed in and wanted to work toward. Uh, to a great extent, his greatest contribution was his ability to get other people to commit to his dream. Kelly Johnson died just before Christmas in 1990. Welcome to the Dronescapes Aviation Channel. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt Me-262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras, and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation, and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage, and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel.
If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.